So thank you, Hala, for the introduction, and uh, good morning or good evening, everyone. So I'll be talking about uh, one part of our study, which is trajectory mapping. Uh, trajectory mapping is really a mapping of children's trajectories to and from schools to capture their food exposure. Uh, and by food exposure, we mean everything that the children see that is related to food and their uh, close environment, which could influence their food choices and uh, diets. Uh, this includes actual food that the children are eating or are seeing other people eating, but it also includes food outlets like here and here and food advertisements as well. Uh, now, this is extremely difficult to uh, to do, particularly if you're working with children uh, because of recall bias, but also because we're really targeting uh, not just uh, food that the children has eaten, have eaten, but also advertisements and outlets. And it's really difficult to ask, you know, the children what, you know, advertisement uh, you have seen on the way to school or uh, on the way back. Uh, so we... Uh, designed a culturally acceptable AI-based tool to capture this uh, uh, food exposure uh, using a combination of wearable cameras and uh, deep learning, which is a, you know, a subfield of machine learning. And uh, really why culturally acceptable? Because we're working with uh, people or children uh, in Tunisia and Lebanon. And so we had to really take this into uh, consideration when it comes to uh, wearable cameras and capturing images, etc. So um, our tool was uh, based on a user-centered design study. So rather than enforcing how the tool would look like, what features it has, we actually opted to do this by uh, conducting uh, a user-centered design study that uh, took place through six workshops uh, with children and six with parents and school staff and uh, 12 schools, four in Lebanon and eight in Tunisia. And these were very interactive workshops where we, uh, you know, engaged uh, both the children, their parents and uh, the school staff and really did uh, a lot of activities, uh, uh, mind maps, uh, various other, uh, um, you know, um, uh, activities to actually design this tool uh, through their uh, input. Uh, this is a, an example of, you know, the things we were trying to collect from uh, the participants in these uh, workshops. So, for instance, uh, we asked them about the device, if we're collecting, you know, images that uh, capture foot exposure, should this be done through a camera or through the phone, uh, the image capturing, should it be uh, active or passive, uh, what should we do with the images we collect, should we filter, uh, you know, the ones that are related to food automatically and remove everything else or do this manual. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, privacy concerns and so on. So uh, this is the results from Tunisia. I'll focus on most of the presentation on uh, results from Tunisia because this is what uh, we have publication about uh, so far. Um, so uh, after this analysis and after this uh, user-centered uh, design study, we came up with this study protocol. So uh, the protocol involves using a wearable camera to continuously record videos of the children's uh, environment for 24 hours. And the cameras must be password protected and with no internet access or removable SD card to uh, protect the privacy of the uh, participants. It should be also shock resistant and firmly attached to the child. Uh, without causing uh, obstruction so that they can you know go on with their day without uh, having issues uh, by using the camera and the camera can be also turned on and off at any time to again preserve their privacy and then we also uh, 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 came up with the idea of using a machine learning model that would take the uh, footage that was collected throughout those 24 hours and then uh, extract frames from these uh, videos and then uh, filter out any images that are not related to food or beverages and keep all the images that are related to food and then automatically blur all faces in any of the uh, images that are retained uh, to protect the privacy of the uh, people in those pictures and then finally a uh, uh, screening phase uh, will be done by the parents to additionally remove any images they don't want to include in uh, our data collection. 
uh, we actually built a desktop application to do this. So uh, we um, basically the application would take on multiple cameras at the same time and very fast uh, and transfer all the footage uh, from these cameras in parallel and then extract the frames by the machine learning model to delete all images that are not related to food and then automatically blur the faces and any retained images and then transfer all of this uh, images on um, a tablet where the parents can uh, finally screen uh, the remaining images. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit now about the machine learning model that is uh, basically a binary classifier that takes an image and uh, decides whether it contains anything related to food uh, or not. Uh, and to do this uh, or to build this machine learning model, we uh, use the data set that we uh, automatically generated by crawling uh, images from both Google and Bing. And uh, the data sets, we had around 1 million images collected, and these were divided into two uh, classes. The food images, these are basically food items, so burger, pizza, and so on, but also food advertisements, restaurants, and outlets. And, and this class was designed in a way so that we actually take into consideration the context we're applying this uh, in. So basically food items and advertisements and restaurants and so on in Lebanon and in Tunisia. And I, I think uh, our students use the help to kind of come up with the queries that would generate these images. And then non-food images would be anything that the child would uh, see on their way to school or on the way back that is not uh, food related. So for instance, animals, uh, plants, uh, you know, objects and so on. And the images were automatically labeled because we used basically the query that generated the image to decide on the label of the image. So if it's a, you know, a burger, then we know that this is a food, an image of a food uh, item. And if it's a restaurant or an ad, again, this belongs to the food class. And if it's something else, uh, like an animal or a plant, then it's non-food. And of course, I mean, there's a bit of noise here. But uh, since we had a very large data set, uh, this doesn't seem to affect the performance a lot. So we actually split the data, uh, the 1 million images, into the standard way in machine learning. So 80% training, 10% validation, and 10% test. We've tried various deep learning models uh, by training them on the training set and then uh, tuning them and comparing them using the validation set and uh, the best model uh, based on our uh, validation set was the mobile net v1 and we had a you know an accuracy of 92 percent uh, meaning that it was really successful in differentiating between food images and non-food images about 92 percent of the time and the f1 score was uh, pretty close so again 92 uh, percent uh, then we actually took this whole uh, tool you know, with all its components from the wearable cameras to the machine learning model to the uh, face blurring and so on, and uh, applied it in an actual user study uh, in Tunisia and as well in Lebanon, but again, I'll focus only on Tunisia here. So uh, the data collection uh, happened in Tunisia from January to March 2020, and then it stopped for a bit because of COVID, and then uh, the field work continued from October to November. And the data was collected from 265 children aged uh, 11 and 12 years in 29 schools. Uh, if I remember correctly, there were 27 public schools and two private schools. And in total, uh, after applying the machine learning model and filtering out all non-food uh, images, we ended up with over 30,000 food exposure images. And in this table, I'm showing just some statistics about the usability of uh, the tool. So as you can see, for instance, around 4% uh, heavily used the cameras and you know, uh, ended up uh, giving us cameras that had footage uh, between 12 and 21 hours of recordings. Uh, and you see that there is a bit of variability in uh, the amount of footage that was, that was collected from uh, the different participants. So some, for instance, around 8% had completely empty cameras, which means they either forgot to turn it on or they opted not to continue with the study. 
Uh, this was, uh, these are some sample results from the user study in Tunisia. So uh, these are the images that you know were uh, uh, retained after applying the machine learning model. And as you can see, I mean, it really captures all the different uh, subclasses of the exposure that we were after. So here, for instance, uh, you can see, you know, uh, this is some food items that the person wearing the camera is consuming. Here, uh, also the same. Um, you know, we have some images of food outlets, even in, in really uh, far in the background. Here's another one with a foot outlet and so on. And as you see in all of the images that were kept, uh, the faces were uh, blurred as we have across. Uh, now, this is great. I mean, we were able to, you know, collect some data about uh, the food environment of the children. Uh, and in our user study, we had 30,000 images. But that, I mean, just, you know, these are all images that are related to food. And that would be really difficult for, uh, you know, the nutritionist, uh, uh, our nutritionist in the team to actually analyze, to go through all of these images and analyze. So we wanted to go a step further and, you know, try to, classify these images further into uh, various classes. So we had three uh, subclasses. One is food outlets, one is food consumption. So meaning the child is eating something, we're seeing someone is eating something. So basically the food consumption class is further divided into personal food consumption, the person wearing the camera is eating, or other food consumption. So the person wearing the camera is exposed to other people eating. And then the third, uh, classes for the advertisement. And for each one of these um, categories, right, or uh, category uh, uh, levels, we had a different machine learning model. Okay, so for the foot exposure model, that basically would uh, classify a foot image into whether it's an ad, an, an outlet, an advertisement, or foot consumption. And uh, this would be a multi level classification task because, you know, uh, there could be an advertisement and an outlet in the same image. Uh, we used the, uh, some of the data that were collected in our user study in Tunisia. So we around uh, uh, 3,500 images. Uh, we took them and then we, uh, these were labeled by five annotators on Labelbox, it's a crowdsourcing platform, and the uh, annotators were employees on the platform. Since this is a relatively easy task to decide whether an image has an ad, an outlet, or uh, foot consumption. And then uh, the data was a bit imbalanced once we labeled it, so we really had to augment it with uh, some publicly available data sets, so the egocentric food data set. We even called some images of food ads because that was the class with the least amount of uh, images. And then we used some of the images uh, that were collected by our data collectors that Chris uh, just talked about, uh, particularly the ads and the outlets. And again, the data was split in the traditional form. And uh, we've really trained various deep learning models and our best model was the mobile net V2. Uh, and you could see here the test results on our test set, the 10% of the uh, data set. And on average, we really had um, a fun score of 96%, which means that the model was extremely successful in differentiating between these three subclasses, the ads, the outlets, and uh, food consumption. Uh, I'll talk next about the uh, food consumption model. So basically differentiating between personal food consumption, others food consumption. Again, this is a multi-label uh, classification task because, you know, an image could have the child eating, but also, you know, uh, ex exposed to other people eating. Uh, so for instance, we have these really, if you look at it, we have these really three cases, uh, personal food consumption. So that's the first set of images, image uh, set A. And that means that the, you know, a child wearing the camera, just eating uh, something. And then we have the second uh, case, which is the other foot consumption, which means that, you know, we don't have evidence that the person wearing the camera is eating, but uh, there are people in the picture that are eating uh, somehow. And then the third class or the third case would be the uh, post the person wearing the camera is eating and as well. Uh, there are other people eating. So for instance, you know, a child is sitting at her dinner table or something like that. Uh, our data was already labeled. 
uh, 3,500 images from our user study uh, because we labeled them not at, only at the upper level uh, ads, outlets, or food consumption, but also to, uh, in these uh, subcategories. And again, we trained various deep learning models and the mobile net v2 uh, uh, was again the winner. And we had an average F1 score uh, in differentiating between these uh, two subclasses, personal food consumption and others food consumption of about 95%. Um, so the last thing we did after, uh, you know, uh, classifying the images into uh, these uh, different categories is to focus on or zoom in on the personal food consumption and try to assess what actually uh, those children that participate in our user study are eating. Uh, so basically how healthy uh, the stuff they're eating is. Uh, so uh, in order to do that, we had to really build two additional machine learning models. The first one was uh, 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 responsible for detecting food items uh, inside an image because an image could have multiple food items. And I'll show you an example in a second. And then the second model was a classification model based on the NOVA uh, food groups to decide how healthy each uh, one of the detected food items in an image is. So here's an example of you know, an image uh, that would, be, would have been captured by a wearable camera. And as you can see here, it's a, it's a meal. So you have multiple food items, like a loaf of bread, a spaghetti, a salad, and so on. And we really cannot say overall this image is healthy or not. So we had to first uh, kind of segment that image and extract the different food items uh, from that image. And that was the role of the food uh, items detection model that we've got. So the food item detection model would really extract the different food items like the loaf of bread, the spaghetti, the salad, and so on. And then each one of those food items would be subjected to the NOVA classification model that would classify uh, the food item according to the NOVA uh, food groups. Uh, Christelle has already gone through the groups, but I'll quickly, you know, uh, remind you, or, you know, if somebody has joined a bit late. So we have four groups, the unprocessed or minimally processed foods. Then you have the second group, which is processed uh, culinary ingredients. Uh, and these are considered somehow healthy. I mean, the first one is definitely healthy because it's vegetables and, 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 and protein and so on. And then the second has, uh, I guess, honey and olive oil and so on. And then group three is the processed foods like bread and canned foods and cheese and so on. And that's uh, somehow unhealthy. And of course, the most unhealthy is group four, the ultra processed foods like soda, hot dog, fried stuff, uh, chocolate and so on. And again, you know, given a food item, an image of a food item, and classifying it into one of these groups as a multi level classification task, because again, a food, even a single food item, could belong to uh, multiple of these uh, groups. For instance, a salad is group one, but then if it has a dressing, you know, with mayo or something like that, then it would belong to an, another group. All right, so now uh, in order to build the food item detection model, we had to actually, again, uh, create some data set. So uh, for, for both the food item detection model and the NOVA classification model. So we took the 1800 personal food consumption images from our user study in Tunisia that were originally labeled uh, manually on label box. And uh, we built an interface on label box so that uh, uh, Tunisian nutritionists will be able to uh, label those 1800 images. And why we relied on Tunisian nutritionists? Because this is a task that requires some uh, nutritional uh, knowledge. So uh, really, uh, unless you're a nutritionist and know the ingredients of a food item and how it is processed, you're not able to uh, decide whether uh, it is healthy or not, or which NOVA group it belongs to. So the interface, the annotation interface looked like this on David box. It was, you know, you, 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 we give them an image and the job was to draw a bounding box on each uh, food item in that image to kind of say this is one particular food item. And then for each one of these food items, they would have to decide on the NOVA group uh, it belongs to, and it could be more than one NOVA. And so 
basically we ended up after uh, annotating all those 1800 uh, uh, images we ended up with uh, over 4000 different foot items extracted from those 1800 uh, personal food consumption images and uh, you know these were all uh, labeled according to their nova uh, groups so for instance you have here and the first set of images uh, one you have the uh, food items that were labeled as belonging to Nova Group One, so really healthy stuff like eggs, boiled eggs, and salad, fruits. You have, for instance, in the second column, you have uh, um, food items that belong to both Nova Group One and Two, because you have here a salad with a dressing, and so on. Then, uh, for each one of those uh, tasks, for the first the food item detection, uh, we again trained various uh, deep learning models, uh, and we ended up using a customized YOLO B3 model that's an object detection model. And its job is to really take an image that contains some food items and uh, draws a bounding box on each one of these food items so we could extract it and uh, subject it to the NOVA classification model. So, uh, we had a really uh, su success in that uh, in, in that uh, task. So we had a precision of eighty seven percent, which says that you know out of all the food items that we detected, eighty seven uh, percent of them were actually food items, and we were able to recall ninety one percent of food items in all the test data that we looked at. And then when it comes to the Nova classification model. We actually, uh, um, again, trained various deep learning models and ended up choosing YMED V2. And uh, on average, we had an F1 score of 86%. So if you see this task uh, seemed to be the most difficult uh, task of all uh, the ones we've had before. And that's kind of, uh, you know, not surprising because uh, it's, it's really difficult to assess from an image, uh, you know, how healthy a food item is. Um, I mean, at least in certain cases, because of again the dressings, and sometimes you have a you know a food item inside a can, and you don't know exactly, or at least the model wouldn't know exactly you know what's inside this can. So it wasn't able to you know capture all the uh, patterns that might be hidden uh, within the image, not 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 apparent in the image. Uh, here's uh, some of the. Uh, you know, statistics from our user study again in Tunisia. So, uh, if you recall, we had collected 30,000 over 30,000 food exposure images, and 95% of those images belong to the food consumption category. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, if you look at this further, so 69% of them were personal food consumption, 23% were personal and others, meaning that, you know, the child is eating something but also seeing other people eating and only 8% were other people uh, eating uh, or consuming food in front of the uh, participant. And if you look at the um, distribution of these uh, images across the NOVA groups, uh, the majority seem to belong to the um, class one, so uh, the NOVA group one, and then, uh, you know, it's uh, kind of a, like a tail distribution in a, in a way, so it kind of, uh, you know, varied between the different classes. Uh, I'd like to go maybe a, a couple more slides on sample results just to show you uh, how uh, the task, uh, you know, ended up looking like. So these are actual images that were collected in our user study, and this is uh, what the food item detection model uh, was able to do. So given an image like this, it was actually able to extract almost all the food items in the image, at least in that image, it was quite successful. So, you know, here's one food item, here's another, another, and so on. For instance, here it made a mistake because it plumped two food items at the same time. So we had some difficulties when, you know, you have uh, an, an, a food item behind another. So there were always some, uh, you know, uh, challenges, if you wish. Uh, another image here where you see you know, uh, different food items. So it's a salad that was extracted, uh, you know, some, uh, I guess, uh, stew, then a loaf, and so on. And, uh, you know, in this third image, for instance, you see that it was able to you know, extract or detect all the food items in the image, but it actually missed one that was very far in the 
background. Uh, finally, I want to look at the uh, you know the Nova classification model results. So some sample results here. Uh, for instance, here we have a salad with some cheese and dressing, and the uh, nutritionist labeled this as belonging to Nova groups one, two, and four. But then our model was only able to uh, predict that it belongs to the first two groups only because it probably missed uh, to uh, realize that it has a dressing on it, which why the nutritionist label it as group four. Here, for instance, in that image, you have some bread with, I guess, Nutella. And uh, the model was able to detect that there is you know, some bread, and it knows that bread belongs to uh, you know, maybe Nova uh, group three, but then maybe it missed the chocolate, and so on. So to summarize and to kind of uh, talk a little bit about uh, future directions, so we were really able to build a culturally acceptable uh, AI-based tool to capture food exposure among school children. And uh, overall, the children experience with the tool was mostly positive, uh, as seen in both Tunisia and Lebanon. Uh, and we could uh, really say that full exposure images are useful to describe children's lived experiences of food environments. However, the quantification of food exposure is difficult due to a lack of continuous footage and variability in recording time and the number of images captured. So that's something, uh, something challenging that we really need to think about how to address. Uh, in addition, uh, we really uh, would like to design a standardized approach to uh, allow the triangulation of results, meaning that if you you know, collect data for 24 hours about the exposure of a child, what does that mean about, uh, in general, about their, you know, diet habits, uh, et cetera? How can you validate these results uh, with other data collected and so on? And when it comes to uh, health, for the healthiness assessment, uh, you know, possible directions that uh, we could look at is rather than, uh, you know, classifying a food item into uh, the Nova groups to look at food item recognition uh, and maybe food composition analysis as well. Uh, these are uh, the three publications that, uh, you know, kind of uh, cover uh, the different aspects that I've presented today. And uh, finally, I'd like to end by uh, thanking the SCALE team. Uh, it was, uh, you know, a great uh, effort from everyone. Uh, and uh, definitely, I mean, uh, it was really a, 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 an amazing experience to see how, you know, all these different components uh, working together. So thank you so much for listening as well.